There is no end to the atrocities that can be committed by one person against another. Today we will talk about a case from Indonesia, an eerie and mysterious case that has remained cold for 41 years. This case is not only a chilling reminder of the pain and suffering inflicted by mankind, but it also serves as a critical lesson of why justice and accountability are essential components of any society. This story contains disturbing descriptions of murder, so viewer discretion is highly advised. Today we learn about the Satya Booty 13 case. On Wednesday morning, the 23rd of November, 1981, two security guards of the Garuda Mataram building were getting ready to start their shift. They checked around the building as usual to prepare for the day as employees were starting to arrive. It was at this time that their eyes caught two cardboard boxes neatly laid out on the sidewalk. No one passing through the boxes seemed to bother checking the oddly placed packages. After observing for some time, they decided to approach those boxes. When they got close enough, they began to smell a foul odor wafting from the contents of the plastic wrapped box. In response to the smell, they resisted checking further. Coincidentally, there were traffic police on patrol near the building. The two guards reported the mysterious boxes to the police. Unfortunately, they were ignored because the police were busy directing traffic, which at that time was backed up as the clock showed working time. Soon after, two scavengers came to collect garbage around the city to be exchanged for money later. When they saw the boxes, they rejoiced. Their hope was that the box contained a good amount of trash. As soon as they opened the plastic bag inside the box, those hopeful thoughts turned into a nightmare. Their hearts dropped and they screamed in terror when they realized that it wasn't trash inside the box, but mutilated human body parts. One box contained bones and the head of a man, while the other contained bloody sliced meat. The horrific scene and the screams of the scavengers attracted the attention of other passersby. Upon discovering what was found, everyone panicked. The police were notified again. Initially, the police couldn't believe the situation and wondered if it could be the remains of a cow. There was no surprise in the police's skepticism. It should be understood that this case happened back in the 80s when crime in such degree was unheard of in Indonesia. So when they realized it was indeed the remains of a human, law enforcement was called to the scene. The news about the gruesome findings shocked the nation and gave Jakartans a chill down their spines. To handle the remains, the police contacted the Criminology Institution of University of Indonesia. A team of forensic doctors was dispatched to the scene as soon as they received their request. According to direct analysis, the person was likely killed a couple days prior. The body has started decomposing. They also confirmed that one box was filled with more than a hundred sliced human meat and organs such as lungs, liver, and heart. The other box contained 13 bones and a head with a face still intact. Combining the number of bones and the area where the boxes were found, this case was widely known as the Satya Budi 13 case. The boxes were sent to Dr. Tipto Mangun Kuzumo National Hospital to undergo further analysis. An autopsy was performed as soon as possible to avoid further decomposition. A team of forensic doctors was assembled and was led by a highly respected forensic doctor, Dr. Abdul Munim Idiris. Dr. Idiris was left astonished by the horrifying display presented in front of him. Taking a closer look at the bones, the team noticed rough frictions at each end. They concluded that whoever did this might have used a metal saw to cut the bones into pieces. The bones were very clean. It had no flesh or tissue attached. 
This display suggested to the team that the killer had some medical knowledge and knew how to make sure the bones were cleaned before cutting them into pieces. This showed a level of premeditation and coldness that was alarming. Dr. Idiris's team, however, speculated that whoever killed this man did not act alone and was highly skilled. The time of death was assumed to be November 21st, 1981. Cleaning the flesh off the bones and slicing it into nearly 200 pieces would have taken a great deal of time and patience. In comparison, a team of skilled forensic doctors may spend two hours cutting open a body for an autopsy. From the remains, however, they concluded that this was done within three to four hours after the time of death, making it impossible for it to have been done alone. In addition, the organs were also removed through precise incisions. It was done very carefully so as to not cause any damage to the organs. There were several missing body parts as well, including the anus, pancreas, and bladder. It was assumed that the mutilation could have been done in the bathroom. This conclusion was drawn based on the clean and untainted condition of the remains. This meant that the murderers were near a water source in order to clean the remains as they proceeded to cut the man's body. It was dreadful for both the police and the public to know that there were a group of murderers who were insane enough to perform mutilation to such a degree. They urgently had to find the culprits as soon as possible. The forensic team tried their best to rearrange the remains in order to take a closer look at any information they could find about the body. As it was said earlier, the severed head still had the man's face intact and almost undisturbed. The fingerprints were also left undamaged. It was odd because usually murderers would try to erase the trace of their victim's identity to avoid any suspicion directed at them. The forensic report wrote that the victim was a man aged around 18 to 21 years old. This man's physique, when he was still alive, would have been about 5 but 4 inches tall, somewhat chubby, and had several moles on his body. All the recorded information was presented to the police, and later to the public. The police created multiple sketches based on the face of the man to be published. They were hoping anyone who knew the man would come forward and help them to identify who the remains belonged to. At that time, there were also hundreds of missing persons reports. With a number of such cases, there would have been someone coming forward to identify and claim the remains. As the police had expected, hundreds of people came forward to see if the remains were their lost relatives. Those people were willing to see a horrendous, decapitated head while hoping their lost loved one wasn't the one who ended up in such an awful state. Each of the visits was disappointing for the police, while it gave each family somewhat mixed feelings of despair and relief. None of the descriptions given by the family matched any of the deceased recorded data. None of the family also recognized the face of the deceased man. Whoever the poor man was, it was almost as if he led a secluded and lonesome existence that nobody seemed to bother reporting him missing. However, how could he not match any of the data in the government's database? Is there no record of his birth? In the end, nobody came to claim the remains until November 26, 1981. Due to the continued decay of the remains, it was finally decided that it would be better to bury them. The remains were buried in an unnamed grave in Calidaris, West Jakarta. Due to the brutality and the boldness of this hideous murder, Dr. Idris speculated that the murderers were directly challenging the police through this case. This speculation was based on the seemingly reckless steps they took to dispose of the body. The murderers had placed two large cardboard boxes in the busy district of Setiabudi. The Setiabudi area of Jakarta is one of the golden triangle of business and commercial establishments. 
These districts have a more crowded atmosphere than any other part of the city. As such, it seemed that the murderers had deliberately chosen this location to dispose of the body, expecting it to be quickly discovered and for the crime to be exposed. The case was very puzzling because no one testified to seeing anything odd the night before November 23rd, 1981. It was almost as if these boxes appeared out of thin air. This led investigators to believe that whatever happened had taken place in a matter of seconds. Another big piece of evidence was the two plastic bags used to wrap the remains inside the boxes. Investigators tracked one of the plastic bags, which led to a bookstore in the Pasar Baru area. The plastic bag had the logo of a bookstore near that market. However, these findings did not lead to any further leads. The other plastic bag bore the logo of a supermarket, which was located a few meters away from the place these boxes were found. Plastic bags aside, the police also found three evening newspapers published on the 19th of August of the same year. The newspapers looked newly purchased and unused. Again, these newspapers did not provide any other lead for the case to progress forward. Taking Dr. Idris's words, the murderers were clearly challenging the police. Perhaps the target wasn't just John Doe, but law enforcement as well. It could have been an attempt to show the police weren't as competent as they believed. By tarnishing the police's credibility, chaos was stirred in the public. It was evident that if this was their end goal, they had the last laugh. It was even suggested that it was probably the work of the government, perhaps the man was a spy. Various theories were being talked about, but none could be proved. It was quite a shame that the police were unable to solve this grim case. The police were only able to speculate about the motive of the case, which was revenge. Is it possible, however, to commit a crime to this extent purely out of revenge? The public grew restless knowing that there were a group of people who were as evil as the devil himself roaming free. People got very cautious. As both the public and the police awaited the next strike, there were none. No remains that have been brutally mutilated to such an extent have ever been discovered again. There were no signs of other murders committed in a similar manner. It was a relief, but also eerie. This case, however, inspired other sick-minded individuals to become copycat killers. In the years following, mutilation cases committed by different individuals occurred every now and then. But there is no way to know for sure whether each of the murderers was inspired by the Satya Budi 13 case. People were just assuming. It has been 41 years since the discovery of the body of an unknown man, brutally mutilated and left in a busy working area. This case has become cold due to the lack of lead and the absence of new clues that could be traced. This mystery may have slipped the minds of many people, but it still haunts the police. Who was the man? Who murdered him? And why? If the perpetrators are still alive, are they watching each retelling of their crime with a smile of pride? Regardless of the theories and assumptions made, there is only one truth. No one knows how far a criminal can go in committing his crimes. We can only fight to protect ourselves and those we love. That's all for today. Thanks for watching.